I will call the August 27th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to order. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Debbie Moore. Present. Patrick Connell. Here. Cynthia Meyer. Here. Matt Lassen. Here. Cheryl Lee. Present. Greg Sherry. Here. Tom Dawson. Present. Pablo Cerna. Here. And Richard let us know that he would not be in attendance, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We do have a quorum. Uh, the second item of business is citizen comments. Do we have anyone that wishes to speak on any item that is not on the agenda? Not at this time, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Having none, we will move on to page two. Uh, items for individual consideration. Item 3A, consider action to approve meeting minutes from the June 22nd special meeting and June 27th, 2019 regular meeting and July 9th special meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. They've been sent out earlier. Is there any additions, corrections, deletions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion, uh, motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Item 3B, consider action to recommend approval of the Blue Bonnet Acres, Lot 6A and 7A, Block 4, Section 1, a replat of Lot 6 and 7, Block 4, Section 1, being 7.404 acres, located at 437 and 443 Union Chapel Road, within the City of Bastrop Voluntary Extraterritorial Jurisdiction, and forward to the September 10, 2019 City Council meeting. Ms. Bills. Sorry. The original subdivision in that area was uh, recorded in 1961. And since then, some of the property owners have changed uh, boundary lines through deed division. Uh, which the only way to officially change lot lines in a recorded plot is through another subdivision process. So this is coming uh, as a replat to acknowledge the lot lines that have been established through the deed division. Uh, so you can see here, this is the location of the lot it's on. Um, well, it's 443 and 437 uh, Union Chapel Road. It is in our voluntary uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction area A. So it is a little ways out from the city limits. Uh, the, you can see in the yellow at the bottom, uh, the original lot six and seven extended a little further uh, to the southwest, um, but the, the current lot ownership uh, is the portions of lots, what we're now calling 6A and 7A, um, are, being, are what's considered tonight. Uh, you can see here on the plat, uh, the 6A will be about 3.717 acres and 7A will be 3.687. The remainder of lots six and seven are under the current ownership of the lots to the south. Um, and they were contacted uh, by the applicant and they were served notice through this process that this replat was happening. So they know um, that this is happening and if they want to rectify their plats in the future with those remainder tracks, they'll have to come through the same process. So just to clarify, they are aware that they've claimed ownership of that unclaimed section, so to speak. Yes, and yeah, so it's in their deed. this does not affect their change that for them, no, correct? No, it's still, it's, it's in, been in their deed for years. It'll still be in their deed. It just affects their lot of record uh, status because they're not, they basically have, you know, lots, I think, 13 and 14, and then portions of lots 6 and 7 is what they own now. So, so will we technically have two island landlocked pieces of land? Yes, that can't get permits until they fix the lot of record issue, legal lot issue. but the applicant did contact them to invite them to participate with them in this replat process to fix that, and they declined or did not respond. So what a curiosity. So the adjacent lots, which were officially platted at one point, that now claim ownership of these pieces, they can mm -hmm. still develop those other lots. They just can't develop on the small piece. That yes, they'll, they'll they have to adhere to the lot lines and the setbacks. Yeah, they just that can't, mm -hmm. the they plan. can't cross, yeah. Uh, so the replat that is being considered is in compliance uh, with our process. Um, some replats can be administrative uh, with the considerations here. Uh, we thought it best to take it through the public process so everyone was notified. Um, but otherwise, staff recommends approval of this replat. 
and the uh, applicant is here if you have any questions. Any further questions? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. There's no public comment. Make a motion that we approve. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion, uh, motion and second. Would you please call the roll. Debbie Moore? No. Patrick Connell? No. Cynthia Meyer? Yes. Matt Lassen? Yes. Cheryl Lee? Yes. Greg Sherry? Yes. Tom Dawson? Pablo Serna? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, item 3C, consider action to recommend approval of the Pecan Park Section 1B and 7, preliminary plat being 117.695 acres out of the Mosea Russo Survey, abstract 56, located south of the future extension of Sterling Drive and west of Childers Drive within the city limits of Bastrop. Texas and forward to the next available city council meeting and forward to September 10, September 10, 2019 city council meeting. It'll go to the September 10th city okay. council meeting. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Got an extra line in there. Uh, so this request is for a new preliminary plat for sections 1B, 2, and 7 of the Pecan Park Residential Development. These will be the last three sections of the Pecan Park Residential uh, plan development portion. Um, everything else is already under a preliminary final plot. So these will be the last three sections to build out. Uh, the location of this is to the southwest of their uh, overall site. My pointer wants to work and it doesn't. Um, so you can see it goes right up to the river um, and includes um, some area in the flood, flood way as well. Um, that'll be left as open space. Uh, the zoning on uh, this area is uh, plan, uh, Pecan Park Plan Development, a zoning district that have their own uh, plan development district that was established in 2015 and amended in 2017. Uh, you can see the preliminary plat, um, they ha it has three different sections of uh, residential houses, um, and then there is one, uh, the amenity center lot for this development is also in section two. Uh, this also includes uh, a great deal of what is actually flood away, so that's area that cannot be developed in um, it's not just floodplain, it's floodway. It's where the water is expected to go during um, rain events. Uh, so with this preliminary plant, but, um, it'll be extending, my pointer doesn't work, it'll be extending Childers Drive uh, along the um, north side of the lots and kind of in the middle through um, sections 1B and 2. And it'll connect over to Sterling Drive, uh, which then connects north and connects back to Agnes Street. So this is the second connection uh, for this side of Pecan Park um, that provides connectivity out of the development. Uh, it includes 299 single family lots. Uh, there'll be a mix of 40 foot lots that have a minimum of 4,600 square feet in size, and then a single family select the 50 foot wide lots that are 6,000 square foot minimums. Uh, it also includes a 1.2 acre site for the Homeowners Association Amenity Center, and then uh, there'll be a 17.224 acres that the HOA uh, will own and manage for the uh, for open space and drainage for the development, which is all in the floodway. And then there will be 38.083 acres that will be dedicated to the city um, as access um, to the river and for our maintenance long term. But again, those are floodways, so you can't develop it. So these are not going to be active parklands that they can put playgrounds or buildings in. Um, the developer ha has been putting in um, some mulch tra trails, things that are uh, eligible under FEMA rules to be located in the floodway. Uh, staff has reviewed the preliminary plat and is in compliance with our regulations for subdivision. And the recommendation of staff is to approve the preliminary plat for Pecan Park. Then the next step after this will be for the, the developer to do their public improvement plans for the subdivisions. Any, any questions? Any so, so this is the preliminary plat. This just gives the preliminary layout of all the roads and lots. And the next step is they actually have to turn in the public construction plans or public improvement plans uh, that detail how they're going to put in all the utilities and the streets, um, the actual construction of them. And they'll most likely phase those in 1B, 2, and 7, bring them in one section at a time. And the developer is here if you have any questions. And we do have one person who'd like to speak, Mr. Daniel Bailey. And Mr. Bailey lives at 107 Breakwater in Bastrop, is that correct? That's correct. Thanks, uh, sir. My house is within that 200-yard uh, uh, 
uh, I guess, boundary that uh, you sent us a letter and asked us to maybe consider this. And uh, while it's, first of all, I thank the council for what they do. Um, I'm actually applying for a commissioner position yep. here with the city and volunteering, so I know that uh, y'all put in a lot of hard work. Um, it's hard to stop progress. And uh, I'm quite sure Bastrop is excited to have this developer come in and provide uh, 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 single family housing. Uh, I, I know at one time uh, Bastrop uh, was begging for places for, to put people and uh, for them to live. Um, when I first looked at this, and I don't know if you had an opportunity to take a look at this, was I noticed that the lot sizes got much smaller. It went from 60 foot. I live in a in the uh, David Wigley home, and it's 60 foot. Now we're down to 40 and 50, and uh, I'm quite sure the developer has done that on purpose because that allows him an opportunity to put more money in his pocket. If he's going to do that, I want to hold him, hold his feet to the fire, and make sure he does the things that he's supposed to do or he has promised the city. Uh, have, is the developer here by any chance? Okay, I don't know. Uh, uh, what they have discussed with you, but I live very close to this undeveloped park, and uh, we went down there on that trail, and there's just a big hole with, uh, that's holding water for mosquitoes and turtles, and I understand there's an alligator down there. So um, if, 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 if we're going to set that aside for a park and recreation, we need to make sure it's safe, it's accessible, and it meets the city standards. Um, I don't oppose this development. But uh, if we're going to take and um, uh, reduce the, uh, my home is over 300,000 and they're advertising homes for 200,000 in that area. So automatically my home value is going to diminish uh, just being in close proximity to these other homes. So uh, I guess my only concern is uh, make sure that the developer is, is, is keeping his promises and putting his best foot forward in the interest of Bastrop and the residents of Bastrop. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that this is not something that the developers has slipped under the doorway when we weren't looking. Uh, these, this has been discussed in the past, and we expected different size lots in this development. But I, uh, the developer may want to speak to the trails that are being laid out and the hole with holding water that Mr. Bailey spoke of. Would you like to answer any of that? Don't rush up to the mic now. <laughs> or if he wants to talk to him outside, that's fine too. I will say so. What he's referring to um, on the site is you know, my pointer is not working, but you see that solid black line that comes down. It's kind of the match line for this. Actually, no. It's that drainage channel. There's kind of a finger that reaches up to the street. Uh -huh. So that side on the east, uh, there is some drainage uh, structure in that area. And with this, um, with public improvement plans for this section, that is one of the uh, one of the items that we're reviewing and staff is discussing with the engineer is how, what is the long-term maintenance for that area and what is their maintenance plan for that drainage basin. So that is actually an item and an active Clarify, discussion. Is it part of the drainage plan? It's intended, it's intended to hold water or it's just doing so now in the interim? But that's It's, it's the, planned to hold water. Okay. And so do, um, as far as the mosquito issue, I assume and that's one of, that's, just like everywhere else in the city. Well, it'll be, it'll be maintained by the HOA, so that's one of the things we're requesting is a document stating what the maintenance plan is for this area, and it, have that in the HOA document so we have someone held responsible for that maintenance. And just like I like to do with stuff like this, this has met all of our subdivision guidelines. This is yes, a ministerial and process, and so we don't have the authority to deny it as long as it's meeting those. Yeah, and they, um, that ordinance. Uh, lost my slide. So the, the mix of lots, patio homes, and single family select were both uh, lot sizes in their original plan development document. And it has a, it, the document did give them wiggle room on percentages of different products, so they're still within their bounds for the, the plan development as it was presented back in 2015 and 17. Any other questions? I would just say, is there, as far as just the drainage, the retention pond, is there an anticipated, I mean, are we going to have this resolved before the final plat, or is there an idea about just making sure this gets done before everything's finally platted and built and we know it's... It'll, it'll have to be resolved with the construction plans for the next section because it's shown in those construction plans. Anything else? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve as is. Motion to approve as is. Second. second. Motion and second. Will you please call the roll? Debbie Moore? Yes. Patrick Connell? Yes. 
Cynthia Meyer? Yes. Matt Lassen? Yes. Cheryl Lee? Yes. Greg Sherry? Yes. Tom Dawson? Yes. Pablo Serna? Yes. Thank you, Commissioners. It is approved. Item 3D, public hearing and consider action to make a recommendation on an ordinance for a planned development district with a base district of single family seven to allow a residential development of 65.926 acres out of the Nancy Blakey survey, abstract 98, located south of Agnes Street and east of State Highway 304, an area currently zoned general retail within the city limits of Bastrop and forward to the September 10, 2019 City Council meeting. Mr. Matt, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you, Madam okay. Chair? Good. Uh, thank you all, uh, Commissioners and Chair, this evening. Uh, as our Chair stated, this is a request for uh, residential rezoning for the Grove uh, Plain Development District. Uh, so just a little bit about the site. It's uh, south of Agnes Street and uh, east of uh, State Highway 304, and it's approximately 65 or 66 acres. Uh, the property owner, Holt Dunlap and Waymaker Ventures, the existing land use, um, it's, it's vacant uh, for um, an undeveloped. Um, the existing zoning is general retail, and the future land use plan has this area as transitional residential, and we'll get to a little bit uh, more about that here shortly. Uh, so again, they submitted a, a zoning request. Um, it is for um, a single, it's a plan development district with a SF7 base. Um, they do have, um, uh, I believe it's 330 single family detached lots, uh, some open space, uh, uh, approximately 5.9 acres. Um, and there's also an LCR easement, a 100 foot wide easement that uh, kind of dissects the property. Um, it runs east to west across the property, and some of that um, open space is within that easement uh, where they provided some trails and some benches and uh, some other improvements. Uh, so just some exhibits. Uh, again, this is a location map. The property outline is there in red. Uh, you can see where Agnes Street uh, would come in just to the north of the subject property, and then they do own uh, the, the, the two fingers that extend out there to the west that would, uh, they're proposing connections to uh, uh, Highway 304. Uh, so this is a current zoning map. Again, it's a general retail zoning uh, for the entire site, and they're uh, requesting a residential plan development. Uh, this is a future land use map. Uh, so as I stated uh, earlier, it is uh, transitional residential. Uh, so from the, um, from the comprehensive plan, uh, transitional residential is defined as areas that are higher density uh, with a variety of housing types, which are included in uh, high density single family detached, single family attached, and multifamily. Institutional resident, uh, residential um, as well as assisted living facilities would be okay there. I uh, just call for variation in form, scale, and density, uh, but to allow for appropriate transitions between land uses. Um, and then it says in some cases it's part of a larger plain development district um, with, uh, to, buy, to provide transitional areas to neighborhood residential. Uh, this is a thoroughfare plan map. Um, I apologize, it's a little bit difficult to. Is our clicker not? Okay. It's not working, all right. Well, this is, you can see, um, if you come off the red line, Highway 71, you'll see uh, Highway 304 is the green line to the south, and then just below, oh, beautiful. Who's back there? Colin, my man. Okay, so you can see he's zoomed in there. So uh, just south of the red line uh, is Highway 71, and then you come to this property, and you'll see two of the blue collector streets come through that, um, both of which, um, uh, one of them aligns here, and then the second one on the south would uh, kind of sweep down to the south of this property. Thank you, Colin. Uh, here is their concept plan. Uh, you can see um, it's a kind of a variety of, of, of detached uh, single family residences. They've kind of created um, kind of a, 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 not a boulevard feel, but there's that LCR re um, easement that runs east to west. That, that would be depicted as the blue that runs all the way across this property. Um, and what they've done is they front loaded um, a smaller product uh, that's going to be alley loaded off of that. Um, so it'll kind of be this tree line boulevard. Um, along that LCRA easement, so that open space to kind of play off that. Uh, they've included some trails and some things like that in there as well. Um, again, this is just another conceptual plan showing the lot and block layout. Um, given the fact that it does have that easement in there, uh, they tried to provide as much connectivity as possible without crossing that uh, LCRE, LCRA easement uh, too many times. And then uh, there on the, on the right side of this picture, or on the east side of the property is a, is a drainage feature, um, so they're also bound by that. Um, now this collector road that's gonna be on the south side of the property uh, will extend across that uh, at some point in the future, but the, the, um, the local streets or the residential streets within the development itself, you can see do not, are not showing to continue across uh, that drainage channel. 
Again, this is their park and open space plan. I think there's approximately six acres of, of open space, um, of which I believe about 3.5 acres of that are, are under the LCRA easement. Uh, so that would be um, a more active or passive uh, open space. Uh, they, Colin, can you zoom on in on that for me, please, sir? Just anywhere. There we go. So you can see that um, they have a s system of trails in there. They've uh, programmed for some benches. Um, also, that they've spaced their street trees uh, that will provide uh, shade um, there along the, the streets and along that park. And they've also programmed areas for different playscapes uh, within the different pocket parks. So um, you could uh, imagine that um, some of those uh, back there, there you go, they're calling. Uh, the two larger ones might be programmed with some type of playscape in the future. Uh, this is the uh, so we just wanted to make sure that um, utilities were available and could be provided to the development. Uh, so they provided a preliminary utility plan uh, with water, wastewater, um, uh, to show that uh, it can service the proposed development. Uh, so staff is confident uh, that uh, there are utilities available that would, uh, that would serve this site. Um, drainage, uh, so uh, like I said, there is the drainage e uh, easement uh, that goes along the east side of this property. There you can see, the other, so they're going to propose uh, to run the drainage to that easement. And I'll, I'll look, they're here tonight if you have any specific questions on that. Um, but that would uh, uh, convey the stormwater within the development. Um, the street connectivity, I mentioned that uh, they have the, the stub out there uh, to the south that'll provide connectivity to the east. Uh, and then they do provide two uh, connections to FM 304. Um, and then the one stub out to the north through that uh, adjacent commercial property. Um, and I believe that is all for the exhibits they've provided. Uh, so as far as the staff recommendation, um, we've been working with them quite a bit on the two connections on uh, Highway 304. Uh, staff would recommend that uh, we shift that secondary access from Small Mouth Road to line uh, with the proposed thoroughfare plan that's gonna be adopted uh, here shortly. Um, that would increase the distance from the proposed signalized intersection at 304 and Agnes Street. Um, I do know that the applicant has an email uh, from, from TxDOT saying that they would probably allow a, a ride in, ride out at that um, northern driveway, uh, and so the applicant does have that. Matt, clarify what that means. Pardon? The right in, right oh, out. Oh, sure, yeah. So, so this is the north driveway entrance there coming into the property that would provide one of the access off 304. Uh, TxDOT's given them email verification that they would allow that to be a right in, right in only. So you could not make a left turn exiting, and you could not make a left turn entering. So you could only turn right out of it or right into it. You would not be allowed a left hand turn into or out of that uh, northern drive. Uh, and that's part of the reason for staff's recommendation. So if they could uh, move that and align it with the, the road that runs along uh, the northern side of the LCRA, that would meet the separation requirements and allow for full access. And it also aligns up with the uh, thoroughfare plan, for proposed thoroughfare plan, rather. Um, so the second there, um, uh, the, like I read you earlier, the future land use plan calls for a mix of um, housing types and, uh, and forms. Um, so staff has recommended that they, A, add a 50-foot minimum, which they have um, done, um, or similar. So, um, and then we have also recommended uh, that they provide some additional type of higher density use uh, that's just straight out of the comprehensive plan. Um, we said that that could be some type of a, an attached uh, single-family residential um, or some type of multifamily. Uh, we've had conversations with the applicant, and I'll let them uh, give you the answer on that. Uh, but uh, just given that the, the future land use plan calls this area transitional neighborhood, uh, we feel like that there needs to be a different um, product type, not just a detached single family type. And have a little bit of issue here. All right. Uh, and, and so, and again, that recommendation is just straight from the, the comprehensive plan for transitional uh, uh, residential um, for that land use designation. And then let me get my power. Um, are there any examples of, so I'm the 35 foot, I see examples of the um, elevation for a 40 foot lot, anything for the 35 foot, I'm not seeing it, I didn't see any in the prelim or and I'm not seeing it now, so do we have any examples of that? There we go. I don't, um, we don't have anything uh, that was submitted with the PD document itself. The applicant is here, he might be able to help shed some light on that, but there's nothing in the PD document itself that speaks to it. Uh, other than kind of the, the, the separation, uh, that would be required for different elevations on the four plans, um, that would still hold true to each uh, lot size. Uh, so you would have that, but I don't think we have a, a specific example. Um, and then staff has had uh, conversations about um, orienting. Um, so along their, their northern and western border, uh, it's still going to be general retail. 
Uh, so going from a general retail to a single family uh, detached product is a pretty sharp uh, transition. There's not any kind of land use to buffer that uh, from one another. Uh, we recommended that they uh, try to incorporate some type of uh, higher density use and maybe integrate it uh, to the site. I, I realize that it's challenging for them because they're not the owner of that dirt, um, but we've uh, kind of recommend that they, they take a look at that. And again, I'll let them speak to that. Uh, so that is staff's recommendations. Uh, with that, I haven't, I can, I'm available for any questions and also the applicant uh, is here this evening to answer any questions as well. Yeah, I have a question. Did, were there any recommendations regarding that, that interior space where the LCR easement is for, for landscaping or what is the plan yeah. for that? Yeah, so they're kind of restricted because it's an overhead easement. Uh, so what they did is load the opposite side of the street with uh, street trees. Um, but they did, um, they, they, in talking through that, they were uh, willing to provide some type of landscaping uh, within those parks and open spaces um, where allowed. Uh, but the, the document doesn't really speak to that because LCRA does limit you on what you can put within those easements. You said that the staff recommendation for 50 foot minimum on, on some of these has been worked in, but. Mm -hmm. That's after this. That's after this was submitted, right? Because all I'm seeing is 35 and 40 foot lots. Yeah, that that was after. So this was originally planned to go last month, and so that happened afterwards. Okay. Uh, so they are willing to do the 50 foot, uh, but still, we would like to see a different product, not just detached single family, some type of higher density that uh, reflects the the language in the comprehensive plan. And what is this in the staff's idea? Sorry, in the staff's idea, what is that other product type that you, you guys are thinking? Yeah, I guess several options in the comp plan. It could be a, a townhome, it could be a duplex, quadruplex. It talks about apartments. Uh, it allows all of that. Just making sure we're all on the same page. Okay, yeah, and, and my, I would think it just an appropriate one that would provide some transitional between that general retail to, to the detached product. Greg, did you have a question? No. Okay. So are we ready to, um, and I haven't opened the public hearing yet, but is staff ready to forward this to the city council before we have some other questions answered by the developer? Uh, that's um, up for your uh, discussion tonight. If y'all are comfortable making a recommendation, um, you've, you've seen what staff is, would like to see um, within the development uh, if you were to vote for approval on it. Um, uh, so that would be those three things uh, that we still have some concerns about, um, but it's, uh, it's your show, ma'am. And okay. so if y'all are comfortable with it to where you would like to make a recommendation, that's completely fine. Uh, they, I, I believe they do have plans for an HOA. That's um, something that, again, is on the private side. If you have specific questions on maintenance or anything like that, the applicant's here to address those questions. I think I'd like to hear from the applicant. Yes, ma'am. Quick question sure. about it. Just looking at the future transportation, the proposed transportation grid, so the number of potential streets going through this area that aren't necessarily represented by the, by the current layout. Yes. Yeah, so every 660 feet, you would have a uh, farm lot. And then every 335, uh, you'll have a building block. So within the 65 acres, uh, a building block is about three and a half acres. So you'd have several blocks within here. Um, they, I will say they, they did try uh, to provide that connectivity, um, but they do have a challenge on the, on the east for the drainage. Uh, they do have that LCR easement. Um, what we would like, so we have Agnes, and then if you were to move that, that northern entry, that would provide you kind of that third entry um, to provide that, that better access to the site. And that's one of the reasons for the recommendation. Uh, but they do show the, the collector road or the road there to the south, which would be their southern entrance, would meander down and then uh, adjoin that property line and uh, go across that drainage feature. So as far as future connections across that drainage, I mean, they can be made, they're just... Yes, they can be made and, and they will be made. Um, it, it's not negotiable. Um, it's just given the fact that there, there would potentially be one, two, 
three, four, five on that one development. Um, you know, I don't know that it's appropriate to have that many. Uh, so the, the, the third fair plan, the proposed one, will even say you can break that grid uh, where appropriate for geographic uh, restraints. Um, so certainly having to traverse that with a bridge every time uh, would be. Um, now it doesn't mean you cannot provide connectivity, uh, which is why they're proposing that one on the south. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know that one is financially uh, responsible um, to have one every, you know, 100 or 300 feet along that property line. But the connectivity needs to be there, um, and, and it's going to be on the south side of that property. Anything else before we hear from the developer? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, please tell us who you are and what your role is in this. Good afternoon. My name is Seth Merrig. I'm with BGE. We're the engineer on the project here on behalf of Waymaker Ventures. I wanted to address a few of staff's concerns on the project. Uh, I think we should probably start on the northern connection to 304. Uh, my client owns the property that you see in the connection. Um, I guess what's probably not showing up on that map is that we've aligned that access with uh, drive on the other side of 304. It's uh, near the gas station. It's also um, an access for multifamily development that's uh, currently under construction right now, and that uh, meets all of the TxDOT access requirements. Um, with negotiation with the city and TxDOT, we've agreed to limit that to right in, right out, although we have an approved TIA that has um, a queuing length that shows that it could meet full access requirements, um, but we understand that it, it might be best to limit access to 304 in that location. Uh, I, what's probably worth mentioning here is that if we move that access down south to the easement, that TxDOT would likely not be able to prohibit access for the commercial development along 304, so they would get a commercial drive uh, legally. and if and TxDOT's tried many times to prevent access to state highways um, in ways that don't meet their access requirements, but that would meet their access requirements. So it's very likely that if uh, we do not build a public right of way in that location, that there will be a commercial type two driveway in that location anyway in the future. Um, and my advice as an engineer is that we make that a public right of way connection. I think it'll be the safest right in, right out connection, making that a public right of way versus a commercial drive. And again, they don't own the land to the south, so there's not really a feasible connection for them to come out by the easement. If you grant that, there's almost 100% likelihood that the commercial drive will exist in the future anyway. So with those uh, aspects in mind, that's why our client has chose to leave that access uh, where you see it right now. Um, the lot mix uh, requirement or suggestion that staff has brought up, we've worked with the staff over the last um, roughly a year to work up the plan that you see on, on the screen right now. Uh, the rear load 35 product was something that we had discussed pretty extensively with staff and added um, to provide um, some type of variation in product. It's rear load, it has a great street appeal if you're walking along either of those roads, north or south of the easement, you'll see kind of a great street scene, no garages on the product um, from the front, so it'll be a, a great look. We've also agreed uh, within those blocks, we have some spacing that allows us to put um, about the 5% 50-foot product in there. Um, I would suggest that um, three product types on a 300-lot, 330-lot subdivision is a, a good number. Um, I don't necessarily think that putting four product types um, on something this small would be very suitable. The project before us had two product types on 300 lots, so I think this is going um, pretty above and beyond to make sure that there's a, a variety of products available on this. Uh, so the, your definition type. of product type is simply a single family, single family residence, but a different lot width, right? Because we're, uh, we're essentially talking about the same product, which is a single family detached property, but it's sure. just a different I, I guess I would thereof. consider especially rear load to be a, a very different product from a standard front load. Th that that product. would be fair, but as far as a 35 or a 40 foot lot, both front load, single family detached. I, I, I think it was mentioned that the 35s were front load, but they are rear load, alley load products. So if you okay. see the green, those are alleys on, on the site. It, they're front loaded onto the park, as it were, but they're accessed from, from the rear. Okay. So those are alley load products where the garage would be facing the alley, not facing out toward the park. So when you're 
again, when you're walking or driving on that roadway by the park uh, with the trees that the developers agreed to, you see the you know front porch of a house and you don't see a garage okay. um, in that area. Just to clarify, so, so I guess that's where I would draw the distinction that it's pretty pretty two distinct uh, types of products. Okay, I would agree on that, but to the point then, so the 40 foot and 50 foot products, what would be the difference between those? Uh, the difference between the 40 and 50 foot product is a, a lot width, right? And typically so, a home size and a price point. So, so we really got two products, I guess, is the point that I'm hearing. We got the rear load 35 foot, and then we got the front load 40 and 50. So two products that we're kind of offering. I mean, I know, I know you may have a, yeah, a I, width I, here that you're defining, but I think the way most of us in the residence see it is the, it's kind of the same thing. I, so I if could, we can, so I could we see can that provide three products, then something more transitional next to the commercial areas would be a third product, I think, in most people's view. That, that could certainly be an interpretation. Has, has the conversation been had with the client about an additional product type, the way we're defining it, either like a duplex or townhouses, row houses, anything? Has that conversation been had on your side at all? It, right, so I think there's been discussion, um, the discussion we had with staff was adding the 35 foot uh, rear load product. I, I don't think there's ever been a very direct request from staff for any type of uh, multifamily on the site that, that hasn't come up okay. today. And I guess the, the final, can you put up the, what's the three items again? Uh, addressing this, the third item, which is the interface between the retail and the residential, we have met um, several times with the developer of the commercial who's actually already submitted a plat. Uh, his development is currently being um, put in queue behind this uh, PDD to make sure that it does work together. Uh, the products that they've mentioned and the users for those pieces of land have generally been uh, unsurprising relative to the location next to the Seton development. Uh, we're looking at some type of medical office development being the most likely. Uh, seeing some of their conceptual plans, which are effectively office buildings in, the, in an island of parking, um, I, I'm not really sure that it would be um, appropriate to either face our residential toward that type of commercial development. Then the other requirement in Pastor Rock Code uh, for commercial development adjacent to residential is that they build a screen wall. Um, so that would be a requirement on the commercial development to build a screening wall, um, which is an actual either masonry wall, stone wall, between their development and the residential development. So I'm, I think that's an appropriate divider between those types of uses. Uh, medical office isn't a very high intensity use. It's you know very conducive to residential because it generally shuts down, you know, after school and office hours. Uh, but I, I don't really see a good interface between a, a residential use of um, 35, 40, 50 foot products and some type of medical office. It, it doesn't make sense, especially with the code requiring a wall to be built between the two. I, I, our developers aren't seeing a, a great compatibility where we might turn homes and face them toward um, somebody's parking lot. To, to clarify on the, the entrance and egress for this particular um, thing that we're looking at, so did I understand you in the beginning to say that if we were to change or alter these two public right of way here that you have that you've already kind of laid out, that the developer of the commercial side would essentially go searching for a commercial cut in for their for their properties but if we were to approve these that they would want to cut off those and enter off those so there, there's already an agreement at public right of ways can be accessed by anybody we'll get that out right away so they can access that's a public right of way it's not a private street there's no spike strip preventing their access so they can definitely take cuts off of these public right of ways that will run through their commercial development um, what i was saying is on the north side of the easement between the easement and agnes if that um, access road that we have was moved south to the easement, there would be spacing allowed for a commercial driveway between that easement and Agnes. So our public right of way would be replaced by a commercial drive. And sure. it's highly unlikely that TxDOT would be able to prevent that. Are these both, both entrances here off 304, both right in, right out? Uh, no, so the, the south entrance is a collector street that's on Yell's roadway plan. It's Hunter's Point um, going into the Hunter's Crossing subdivision. Uh, TxDOT is currently letting a signal for that intersection, so that'll be a four-way intersection uh, long before there are any occupied homes in this development. So that's a four-way signalized with a complete access intersection. So Matt, are we at, we're at two signals then, like one kind of like right here, this first one and then the one that's proposed at Agnes then? Is that what? There's an existing, or there will be signals at Agnes and signals at Hunter's Point. 
And that's 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 already the, that's already been the plan then, right? Okay. So. Right. So you'll have uh, through the north access from this residential development to Agnes, you'd have access to one signalized intersection. Through the south, you'd have an access to Hunters Point, and then the right in, right out would be from the northern section of the development north of the easement. Can you repeat that? What you said? Uh, it's unlikely TxDOT would use that up to align. <clears throat> item number one, we're trying to get that access point. What were you saying about that? Can you repeat that? Okay, so where you see our, our connection, our public yep. right-of-way north of the that. easement, uh -huh. um, that meets all TxDOT access requirements Correct. for a public right-of-way or a commercial drive. If we were to move our connection south all the way to the easement, which has been suggested by the city, uh, a, this developer does not own that land, um, and, right. and B, it would then meet TxDOT access uh, requirements for a commercial drive between our public right-of-way and Agnes. And I, I, what I would suggest to you from my professional experience is that TxDOT, when you meet their access requirements, they're obligated to give you an access. They can't simply deny you access to state roadways. So the, the commercial development would, in all likelihood, get a drive between our right-of-way and Agnes. Do you think that those are too close to each other? Uh, I do not. So we've completed a TIA. Um, the queuing distance on that, which is basically the conflict between the intersection at Agnes and our intersection, shows that we could have full access with left turns, um, and it would be safe because the queues would not conflict with each other. Um, at the city's request, we've agreed to back that down to a right-in, right-out. Um, but in my professional opinion, it's, it would be an adequate intersection uh, to be a full access. It's worth noting that on the west side of 304 for the multifamily and the gas station, they have a full access intersection right now. They can go out. That's not the primary entrance, but it will likely be the primary exit from that multifamily, and they can certainly turn left right now on the 304, and we would be um, prohibiting that action at our intersection. So it's a safer version of the one that's immediately adjacent on the west side. Could this commercial developer not get a a cut in off 304 anyway, even if the, even if this access point was approved? There's some possibility that they could get one south of the easement, but I it's going to be tight. And and since you all are working together, are they proposing to use these roads? That, that they are, they are currently proposing to use the roads as they're shown. Do we know if they're willing to agree to that, Matt? Period. As a part of theirs. He w they were planning to show up tonight to mention this, but they've previously suggested that they would be perfectly fine using these public right-of-ways. But they, we can certainly confirm that with them. Yeah. I'd like to know from the staff's standpoint with what you heard from the developer tonight, how do you guys feel that what this gentleman has said would comport with your recommendation? Yeah, I mean, we, we completely agree it's TxDOT right-of-way. Um, it was just, I think it was always communicated that that would be our preference to move it down. Um, it, would, it would provide some more equal spacing um, and then it would provide a, an opportunity for development to the north because I don't believe there's room from your drive to the north to have uh, commercial access there, um, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it would just provide, in our opinion, uh, a better uh, location for a drive, but I, I don't uh, it is TxDOT right away. They provided the email to me that says that in looking at everything, they would approve it right in, right out there. It would just be our recommendation that we move it based off our uh, thoroughfare plan that we have, in, have coming in. Are there any other questions? Um, as far as speaking to the screen wall between the commercial and residential, how does the future kind of lay yeah, out of commercial development? You won't see a screen from? wall in the city of Bastrop. No, I, I'd rather give a variance to the screening wall requirement. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going back to my question. This, this, so the, the developer for this commercial stuff is not here tonight, but am I understanding that they've agreed that if these are approved to use those? You own the dirt. Go ahead. Yes, they, they're planning to use those public right-of-ways for their access. I, they have suggested they will not be approaching TxDOT for additional commercial drives on 304 if this alignment is approved. And I'm happy to have Brennan McAtee, who's their engineer, and provide that um, to you guys. I'd, I'd like to see that. I'd also like to know if there's a way that we can link that together, because it would, the fear on my side is, is that, or 
oh yeah, just me, uh, on my <laughs> side is that, is that we approve these and then the, the commercial comes in and says, well, you know, we'd like to try for it anyway and then we kind of, we kind of defeat the purpose of, of approving this as close to Agnes as we are anyway. Sure, and just to clarify, uh, there are commercial drives north of the easement between the easement and our public right-of-way, between our public right-of-way and Agnes would not meet TxDOT access requirements and would certainly be denied by TxDOT. Okay, so, so my I thought you said earlier there was a possibility. There, there's a could. possibility that they could get one between Hunters Point and the easement, but that would be a stretch in that location. Okay. And or do you concur with that? Yeah. I agree. Anything north with the current driveway location has shown anything north of that easement, the commercial would not be able to take access from three okay. or four. Cynthia? Yes. On the right in, right out, um, your point that you made on the west side on that development that does not have the right in, right out, and you can go either way on the other side. Correct. They've had a fatality there because of that. So that's, I, I mean, I think that's a great point. I, my my yeah. thing is, I support totally uh, that to prevent any. And, and TxDOT could certainly come and make, make them make that a right in, right out for safety reasons in the future. And it would align then perfectly with with our intersection, which is typically safest. Okay, thank you. Thank you. At this point, I will open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard at the public hearing? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing, and I will um, entertain a motion. Um, my thought is before before we entertain a motion. My thought is this: is that I would like to see staff go back. Um, and for everybody to have a conversation about a true, what I've considered alternative product, other than just a single family home on two different size lots. Now, if that's a, you know, that's a row house or townhouse or duplex of some kind, provide some variety. I feel like that's kind of in line with what we've been working at for the last, I don't know, two and a half years, Something give, like or, give, or, give or take a little bit. Um, I, I, just to have the conversation, see if it can work out, see if there's a way to, to, to blend that in there because um, single family detached on just two different width size lots. Uh, the rear load, definitely a different type of product and so I'm, I'm down with that being in, in, on its own. Um, if we're going to go to wider lots, I'd like to have that, you guys to have that conversation and then for them to go back and have that conversation about specific different types. Please. Come to the mic. My name is uh, Jamie Doherty with Waymaker Ventures. We're the developer of the property. We have spent 12 months, um, six figures, having conversations with staff. Um, and this is kind of where we are with the product type issue. Um, there's just not going to be um, any need to have any more conversations. We just, this is what we've ended up with. And we hope you guys will be supportive of that. I think we've got a, a good development here. Um, in Bastrop, but we can't incorporate in, in a small development like this um, any more product types. So we've talked to the city about it um, repeatedly, and um, I think just there's a, there's a dis disagreement there in terms of you know what we need to uh, what we need to do going forward. Matt, are, have you are you comfortable with the amount of discussions that had as far as different product types as we're discussing them? I think um, through the through the conversations with them, they've tried to accommodate. Um, we certainly appreciate the fact that they put the 35 foot um, uh, alley loaded product in there. Uh, it's front loaded on the park, so I did misspeak. Um, and then uh, trying to have a, a variety of lot sizes. Uh, but again, from a from a planning standpoint, looking at the future land use plan. Um, that transitional neighborhood area is clear uh, that uh, different types of housing, not lot sizes, um, are appropriate in that location. Um, and, and we've talked with them uh, several times about the, the uh, relationship between the single family residential and the commercial. Um, I understand their challenges, but um, we would still like to see something happen. So, Is it, is it your opinion that, that you guys have talked about it? to the point where they're talking about it more is not going to change anything? Um, I, I have certainly not exhausted my resources. I'm not sure where the, the developer is. I think they're having some frustrations, uh, but staff would be willing and uh, to continue to work on the product. Um, uh, so maybe we could come in uh, where it would actually meet the intent of the, of the future land use plan. 
Maybe we could make a recommendation based on um, continued negotiation with staff and with staff final recommendations to the council. It kind of sounds to me like negotiations are done. Well, it, it, this is what we're getting. This is what we're approving. Here, here's my, here's my here's my stance on this. I can totally appreciate this project is 12 months in the making. I can appreciate that you guys have had these conversations, but if if you're coming up and saying this is it, that's not going to change. Then if that's truly how you feel, and there's no additional conversation to be had, the conversation is whether we're okay with this or not. Um, in my opinion, this does not. This is what we used to be doing. This has nothing, this is totally in the face of what we're trying to do. And so if the conversation is that this is it and that no additional conversation is gonna change that, then we can vote whether to approve this or deny this, but trying to send it back to staff to have them continue to discuss it if, if one side is not willing to discuss it anymore is, is, is pointless. So is, is, is my understanding your guys' position that, that having a further discussion about additional product types is, is pointless? Is that? Yeah. Hold on, Lop. I'm with Winmaker Ventures. Chloe, please yeah. Yeah, introduce sorry. yourself and tell us your role here. Holt Dunlop. I'm with Waymaker Ventures. I'm Jamie and I are partners uh, in this investment. Um, we bought this property in November 2018, and prior to buying this property, we showed staff a land plan that frankly is not altogether different than this. Um, everyone was supportive from the jump. I mean, it was, uh, everyone was excited about it. This seemed to make sense. Um, staff wanted more density, not less. Um, trying to marry staff's desire for density and product variation to the appetite for the home building community is very difficult, especially on a 65 acre track. Um, in our conversations with the home builders, and we've done multiple projects all over Central Texas with, and we know all these guys. When you start talking to them about introducing duplexes, they start to get a little nervous about rental product and things like that. It, it makes the property um, not as appealing for a lot of the home building community that we are developing for. Um, so that is one of the barriers. I mean, we're trying to accommodate staffs desire for some variation, which is why we laid out the, you know, the, the alley loaded product, which we thought was a great solve and would create a really handsome boulevard feel. And um, that, was, that was our solution. Um, staff seemed excited about it. I'm, I'm kind of surprised we're back talking about, um, you know, variation in product. Um, the last notes that I received said that they wanted to add some 50s and, and we complied. We added some 50s. So I thought, frankly, we were over that hurdle. Um, I'm surprised. Was it 50s period or 50s with product variation? It, the recommendation came from Jennifer and I think it was to add some 50s to the mix so that we'd have the 35s, the 40s, and the 50s. Let me, so, so let me, I'd, like, I'd like to interject here. Um, and I appreciate how you have tried to uh, do what you felt needed to be done to comply with what staff's recommending. Um, staff is who, our professional staff is who we look to in the long run to protect what we want Bastrop to be and what we want Bastrop to look like. I understand it's your job to develop a property and build some homes, build some commercial, make some money and go to your next project. And I understand that you have tried and we appreciate that. But at this juncture, I would go with my staff rather than, than run the risk of putting in a product that we may not want Bastrop to look like. Well, I don't think, I think we've been cooperative, I guess is what I'm saying. I, that's what I'm saying. Okay. I understand that you have. And sometimes we just have to dis agree to disagree. Okay. I'm hoping that possibly down the road we can do something, but... At this point, I would stand with staff and not recommend approval. Well, uh, one thing, one question I do want to have, though, is, is this, is, is, and it, to be objective and fair both to the citizens, what we want our city to look like, what we've been spending two-ish years working on. Um, if, 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 staff's under, if staff said this is what we want, this will work, and we're good to go, and they've done that, 
then that's one thing. But it sounds like there's some there's some breakdown between what staff is looking for and what's been what we've come up with. So that's why my question was: Is did we have a recommendation for 50 foot lots with variation of product, or we were okay with the product being the same? We just wanted some wider lots. And that's something I think that they need to talk about. That we may not be able to resolve here tonight. Probably not, but it's just a question that I have as far as that goes. Yeah. So one of the recommendations was a 50-foot lot, um, so that, that is correct. They've accommodated that at 5%. Um, the comment about the transition from the neighborhood into the commercial has been a long-standing comment, um, and so I, I realize, again, the challenge is there, um, but again, that's straight from the future land use plan. So <clears throat> let me address the other two while I'm standing here. Um, the walkability and trying to get the the housing to interface with with our residential development uh, is difficult. We purchased in a, a lot of time, energy, frankly, intellectual capital between uh, myself, our engineering team, and the uh, my seller who I bought this track from went into designing this. Um, they wanted to maintain the frontage. The road locations were heavily uh, designed and negotiated. Um, and to answer your question earlier about, you know, would, would the commercial developer use my road um, on the northern end of 304? Absolutely. He wants me to build it as soon as possible. I have an agreement with him, whereas if he goes before we do, I have to reimburse him for it. So, I hate to interrupt you right now, yeah. but we have a city council back here who needs to convene at 530 and then go into executive session. Okay. After they do that, we can come back and we can talk as long as we need to. <laughs> so can, can we hold that thought and we'll come back in a little bit? All right. Thank you. Thank you. So we're taking a recess then. Recess. Yes, we're in official recess. Convene the public hearing uh, on item 3D on our, the, our agenda for today. So, I think we have had some movement, possibly. Yeah, um, thank you. I, just reading over kind of the latest comments from, from staff, and, and it's just, I want to read this so everyone understands kind of the work that has gone into this and kind of the effort we're trying to make to get this approved, but staff has recommended that new developments provide a variety of lot sizes to provide available space for structures and yards of varying sizes. Please include a lot mix that shows an equal mix of 40s and 50s or propose some additional lot dimensions and variations. So when we initially filled out our application, we said straight 40s. And staff came back and said, let's add some 40s and 50s. We said, fine, and we negotiated again. They came back and said, well, can you give us something else? And we came up with a 35. So we're trying to, to um, we're, we're trying to get this resolved. We want to work with you guys. Um, but I just, I just think you guys need to know what we're, you know, what what's been going on. So, where we are tonight, it, it, what I'd like to do is, I guess, withdraw or table our application or how, whatever the process is. We'll meet with staff. We'll sit down and kind of review this again um, and see if we can come up with a, a solution for this property because we were told when we before we bought this land, Bastrop wanted housing, um, and so that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to provide. So. And we appreciate your willingness to, to continue to work with staff to find a, a resolution. Yeah, thank you. So that we can get it, get it going. Appreciate thank it. you. Appreciate thank it. You. Hey, Matt, is staff unhappy with this proposal? I mean, because to me, a recommendation is way different than an order or a mandate. You know, so are, are we just not happy as a as a no, staff? No, no, uh, not at all. I think that there's a little not bit. Not at all happy. N not at all we're not unhappy okay. is that a double negative uh, we've been working with them for some time uh, like they said um, I think we're trying to push it across the finish line but um, if they're willing to continue that uh, to, to uh, come up with a, like like you said a different maybe third option uh, then we'll continue to do that happily and the only thing I'll say you guys are kind of in a weird your your purchase time of right at the end of last year is kind of a weird was a yeah. weird transition time for the for the city and so um so i i i have sympathy for that and we'll try to work with that understanding the the city of Bathrop, as, as it's well known has taken a position that we're going one way with you know the future of development kind of what we want to see and i think i think we're trying to 
or we're, we're trying to kind of bridge that gap a little bit with what we have, which is what you guys have, which is kind of what we've seen a lot of. We have a lot of that, and we're trying to kind of move away from that a little bit while still well, understanding that you guys have, you know, been working on this for the last 12 months. Come to the mic, please. It's, this is televised. If yeah, you look the back plan before us was straight 40s and 50s approved. Sure. We're going out and we're trying to incorporate, you know, 35s, 40s, 50s, trying to be flexible with, with kind of our, our design and recognizing what the market is. Um, and so we're, we'll, we'll, we'll sit down again um, and, and, you know, we want you guys to be excited about this. We want your support. Um, we think we put a really good plan together. Um, I get the feeling that, that, you know, there's disagreement here. So we'd rather go back and talk to, talk to staff and see if we can, um, you know, come up with something that, that works. Um, Bring us a variation and I think, I yeah. think you, you'll get, you'll, you'll get a, a unanimous support for that if, if, if we can find some type of variation in that or something, we'll, we'll see. But I think that's... So, because the last time we talked about it was 40s and 50s and now we, we're told to get a variation again. And so that's what I'm just... Yeah, I feel I know like we're in this like, circle. We you're keep going around and, and around not, and around. Yeah. And, so, and so get with, with Matt and Jennifer and staff and... And fix, we'll fix it. Okay. I thank have confidence you. in y'all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All righty then. We're moving on to item 3E, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of ordinance number 2019-29 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, amending the Bastrop City Code of Ordinances, Chapter 14, Exhibit A, Zoning Ordinance 2, Administration, Section 8, Planning and Zoning Commission, 8.4, Meetings to Change November and December, Planning and Zoning Commission Meeting Dates to Comply with Texas Local Government Code, Chapter 212, and Forward to the August 27, 2019 City Council Meeting. Mr. John. Thank you. Uh, yes, that is tonight. Uh, thank you for noticing that, and we do appreciate your cooperation in getting this. Um, so, with your and you'll explain why you can. I we will can fully do that. explain. Oh, okay. Uh, um, and what I would like to do, Chair, uh, with your um, okay, is go through items 3E through 3K because they're all intertwined, pretty much the same process. But then they would have to be taken uh, action individually. But that's the way I've set up the presentation. So I hope that's okay with everyone. Fine. All right. We only have two hours. Remember. <laughs> yeah, they're they're back there talking, so we'll try to wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, so, um, w why were all these necessary? All right. Uh, so, first of all, all this is necessary because um, the development uh, process um, changed dramatically when House Bill 3167 uh, was passed. Um, we, we reviewed the required uh, fee schedule changes um, in order to comply with HB 852 and 3167. Uh, we've had to modify existing fees. We'd have to uh, modify our processes. Uh, essentially, everything that the development world touches, we've had to redo. Um, and I'll get to why that is uh, here in a second. Uh, so again, it's to comply with the 86 legislation's legislative session uh, for House Bill 3167. Uh, so their goal, I think, uh, in passing that was to provide certainty and predictability. Um, and uh, that's actually exactly what they've got. Um, unfortunately, it's a lot of bureaucratic uh, predictability and, um, and uh, certainty, um, and it doesn't allow for any flexibility within your plan approval. Uh, so we were headed in one direction with this flexibility of the, the B3 codes, and then the Texas legislator said, nope, uh, you're going to have to do it, just a check the box exercise. So we've had to go back and, and, and go through all of that. So some of the challenges, um, all cities are treated the same. Uh, whether you're a Frisco, whether you're a Austin, whether you're a Dripping Springs, whether you're a uh, Buda, whether you're Bastrop, whether you're, you know, Smithville or Elgin. Doesn't matter the size of your staff, doesn't matter your resources, it all applies the same to you. Um, and that's important because this actually goes into effect September 1st. Uh, hence kind of the mad dash to uh, rearrange the schedule so we could get this before you all. Uh, so you could make a recommendation before the city council meeting this evening. Uh, so Texas Local Government Code Chapter 211 and 212 uh, must be approved, disapproved, or approved with conditions by uh, House Bill 3167 within 30 days or it's deemed approved. So that means we have 30 days to get something through the entire review process 
uh, intake process, uh, review, uh, schedule it for an PNZ agenda and have you guys vote on it or else it is deemed approved. Uh, so that's a really big deal. Um, another thing, yeah, it really quickly, if I sure. I'm a bit confused on that. Hasn't that always been the law? There was no. A 30 day review so there's process. been 30 day requirements for some plats. Um, and that, that's it. Uh, but there was a waiver, per, uh, waiver provision where you could waive that right. Um, so now, uh, now any plan, so site development plan, construction documents, so our public improvement plans, any plat, anything that's not zoning, so a SUP or a CUP or a, uh, a zoning request has to be done in 30 days. So it's, it's, they've brought in that and said you, you shall. Um, what they've also done, and it talks about that in here, is any um, any time we try to disapprove or make a disapproval with conditions, it has to be pointed back to an ordinance, state law, or federal law. So you can no longer have these best practices, well, we would like to see this. If it is not black and white, you cannot require it. Um, so we've had to go back and rewrite all of our checklists, and we've essentially made those checklists our ordinances. So the, the ordinance is then reflects the checklist and it's real easy to know where it came from and why we're requiring it because it's a part of the ordinance. Um, so uh, this is coming before you all tonight. Uh, like I said, it does go into uh, approval on September 1st or in effect on September 1st. So without doing this, we would be in violation of state law. Uh, council has to have two readings. They had a reading on the 14th. They'll have the second one this evening. Um, and then tonight we're here before you all to make a recommendation on these ordinances. Uh, so this again, all plans and plats are subject to this. Um, they must be approved, disapproved, or approved with conditions within 30 days uh, by the municipal authority. And I'll get into that a little bit. Uh, plan is a subdivision development plan, subdivision, uh, subdivision plan, subdivision construction plan or public improvement plan, site plan, land development application, and site development plan. And then a plat is defined as a preliminary plat, general plan, final plat, or a replat. Um, so again, the, the state local government code gives uh, the municipal authority to the Planning and Zoning Commission for uh, most things subdivision related. Uh, it does allow some administrative approval uh, to the planning department uh, when it uh, is an amending plat or things that don't, uh, like when you're shifting lot lines uh, rather. So it, it allows for that administrative approval. Uh, but again, whether it's city staff or PNZ or council, it has to be done within 30 days. Uh, so we have to act, we can't just review, um, and therefore there's not really a, a great comment period from staff. So, so if something has to go for us and then two readings with council, how does that work? So typically, uh, well, A, we're not going to be doing that anymore. So you'll, you'll right. see we're changing our platting. But zoning, for instance, is not subject to this. So a zoning request is, does not fall under HB 3167. Okay, so since we're changing plats to be a, a PNZ thing, right? Yes. Then that's, okay. Yeah, we're recommending that no plat will ever make it to city council. Um, when, when staff can approve it, we're recommending you all delegate that authority to us. Uh, when it needs to come to you all, you all will be the, uh, the municipal authority per state law. Um, so again, it's the, so uh, this is what I was talking about. The municipality has a burden of providing clear and convincing evidence. Um, and so that's where it comes extremely important that your checklist and ordinance were updated. Uh, so this, again, it talks about the uh, conditional approval, how we shall issue a written statement of the conditions for the conditional approval or dis disapproval that uh, clearly articulate, articulates each specific condition. Um, and then it has to be a written statement. Um, and and um, so you can't, uh, again, you can't have a best practices or you can't have uh, staff would like to see. Um, it is all black and white. Um, we uh, cannot, another thing it does is we cannot establish a deadline for them to submit to us. So we can't say uh, you have to resubmit in 12 days, but it does allow us to adopt um, calendars uh, for submittal and those are before you tonight. Uh, so we will only accept those plans once a month. Um, that's it. So. And they, have to, and they have to be in a certain completeness. Yes, ma'am. We're going to do a completeness check on everything that walks through our door within 24 hours. When you say only certain times, is it like a week? Is it one day a month? It is one day a month. So, Mo so most of the times it it'll be a Monday unless it's a holiday. A day, correct? No, I believe the plan, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's to 12. No, I'll have like to look. I think it's to 12. I think it's to 3. But I'll have to, I'll so double check. Basically, I'll if you want to submit a plat or, or something that's defined as a plat, you have one day a month for a certain number of hours. That's right. And then if it. you walk through the door and we review it in that 24 hour period and it's deemed complete, we'll, you'll pass go and you'll continue to the review process. If not, we'll kick it back and you can try again next month. So you only have 24 hours to deem complete or not? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. 
Um, so uh, we'll, we'll do that within the 24 hours. Um, let's see, I think I've talked about most of these things. I've kind of skipped ahead. Uh, again, some, uh, some of the replats require public hearings and the 15 day notice is required in that 30 day. So literally we'd review it and then the day after we have to notify it in the paper. Um, so uh, there's, there's really no room for error. Um, it's an extremely uh, check the box process, um, but it's all again in, in reaction to that house bill. Um, so these are, uh, these are kind of the action plan uh, as recommended from several um, different organizations. You have TNL, TML, American Planning Association, and the Texas City Attorneys Association. So these are their recommendations uh, to do a pre-application conference, which we'll do to define filed, which we do, that's after the completeness check, uh, schedule uniform submittal dates, which we have done, um, implement strict, methodical, timely set of internal procedures, no flexibility, no more informality. Uh, I think we can all agree at the end of this we've done that. And then improve checklists and standardize our forms, and we've done that also through that development manual. Uh, decouple study, so what that means um, with the site plan or site development plan, um, historically, that has been drainage, utilities, uh, vertical construction, it's been lighting plan, some of those things. So decoupling means we're pulling out the, the engineering of that because a drainage plan does not have to be approved in 30 days. So we're going to say before you hit, hit the clock running on the shot clock, you're going to have to have an approved drainage plan before you can file for a site development plan. What about and, TIA? I'm sorry? What about TIAs? We're actually not going to require TIAs uh, with the grid network system. Uh, it actually won't be needed um, unless it's a requirement of TxDOT. Um, but then I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. We require a TxDOT permit before you can submit. So, so, so while we've been working for, for the, we, this year, we've been working towards bringing flooding to the front of the process, we're still able to accomplish that by making that a part of the initial application. Now we're doing that in, in process. We're actually going to make you do your drainage prior to submitting for like a zoning or a uh, preliminary plat. You'll have to do your drainage before. So we're still able to accomplish what we've been getting after. Absolutely. I think it... Um, sooner rather than later. Yeah, about sooner that. rather than later. Matt, I got a question about that. Where are we? So oh. <clears throat> you're saying we have to do drainage before we do some of the platting. Don't they have to have some idea about how that's going to be laid out before they do the drainage? You're absolutely right. Um, they do have to have some idea. And for us, that's a good thing that they have an idea before they submit something through our door. Um, so instead of getting things that are um, less complete, a lot of the times we run into three, four, five cycles of review. Um, well, the problem is we're not getting good stuff in the door. Um, so with this, we'll be held accountable to the standard, but also the development community will too. Um, let, me, let me go through the process and then we'll see if we have some questions. I have a, a lot of slides to cover here um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, but I think this going through it and seeing it laid out might help um, answer some questions. So at a 3,000 foot level, this is just a flow, flow chart of the steps. Um, so again, the development type will dictate your process. So if you have a single lot residential development, um, you have zoning that you might have to do, you have platting you might have to do, and you might have to do public improvements. You will not have to do a site development plan for single, single lot residential. Uh, single lot, multifamily, or commercial, um, you could have zoning, you could have platting, you could have public improvements and site development plans. Uh, residential subdivisions, you have, could have zoning, uh, platting, and public improvements. And then mixed use, um, you'll get hit with all of them, the zoning, platting, public improvement, and site plan. Now, I will note that you could start this process at anywhere on this chart. So you may um, have a, a, a single lot residential that it's already zoned, it's already platted, and you just have to do your public improvements. Uh, you might be in, a, in an area that's already zoned when we do the rezoning. Uh, that allows for commercial development. You, you're a commercial developer. You don't have to do the zoning process. So this meets you where you are um, in your kind of entitlement and or land development activity. So this would be the zoning. So we would require a pre-development meeting for step one. Uh, then then uh, after a pre-development meeting, you can submit the zoning application. Uh, then after that, uh, you have the zoning submittal uh, due per the schedule, so that one day, uh, one day a month, 
uh, and then you know, we would conduct our completeness check uh, within the 24 hour. Well, this would be the, just the completeness check. Um, and then if it's deemed complete, we would start it through the DRC process and then it would come to uh, Planning and Zoning Commission uh, for action. That's not subject to 30 days. That is not, you're right. Uh, but we're still, and, and this is a function of, of staff and sanity, quite honest. Uh, we're only going to accept those once a month also, so we don't have 15,000 different timelines we're tracking. They're going to track through the same process. Uh, so this is a preliminary plat. You have your pre-development meeting. Uh, you can do a preliminary drainage plan, and the first three are se sequential. So you'll do the uh, preliminary drainage plan and get admin approval. And then from there, you'll do an infrastructure plan. And what that is is a bird's eye view of your infrastructure, so stormwater, uh, your wet utilities and your dry utilities. Which side of the street are they going on? Making sure we've thought about that. Uh, steps four through six are actually concurrent and this is where it talks about the tech stop permitting. So because we only have 30 days to approve it, we don't want to be having those discussions with you while we're reviewing your plan because that alone could take 60 days. So you're going to have to have your tech stop permit uh, prior to submitting that preliminary plan. Uh, then we know you're approved. We know where the right of ways are going. Uh, TxDOT's told us that. Um, if you're in the Lost Pines habitat, you'll have to have that towed permit prior to submittal. Um, and then any temporary construction easement. So if you're needing a drainage easement across a property, uh, you have to have that in place prior to. Uh, reason being, if, if we don't, that could take longer than 30 days and then you'll have a, a, a deemed approved set of plans on your hands. And after the steps one through six are taken, then you're ready to file for a preliminary plat. So that process, um, the plat submittals uh, do per that schedule. Uh, we would conduct the completeness check and then if complete, it would go to DRC for review um, and then uh, if appropriate, go to PNZ for action. Uh, so the PNZ again must act within 30 days, um, not scheduled for an agenda, not anything like that. Uh, you, you shall act upon it in 30 days or it's deemed approved. Uh, public improvement plans, this necessarily wouldn't go through you all, but it's kind of part of the subdivision process. So you'd be required to do the final drainage plan first. Uh, and upon completion of and an approved final drainage plan, you can then move uh, forward with your public improvement application. Uh, you submit it per our schedule. The completeness check is done. We meet with DRC and the city engineer would make a recommendation and then it would be an administratively approved uh, by the DRC and then uh, final authority would be the city engineer. Uh, construction, uh, you would have a public improvement plan agreement approved by city council. Uh, and then once that agreement is done, we can hold a pre-construction meeting with the uh, developers. Uh, we would issue a notice to proceed by the city engineer. Um, then they would start the construction pro pro uh, process, so installing streets, the water uh, infrastructure, sewer, things like that. Uh, they would do our inspections and do the walkthrough uh, towards the end of the project and create a punch list. Um, and once that punch list is completed, then their engineer would submit um, a letter of compliance uh, with the approved uh, with the approved public improvement plans, um, and then our city engineer would issue a letter of concurrence uh, with that, saying yes, it's installed for the approved plans, um, and then they would be eligible to submit a final plat. And at that point, all the complexity of a final plat is done, and it's again kind of just um, a record drawing showing lines on a map. Uh, so the final plat process um, uh, would go uh, through our submittal schedule, completeness check. I'm going to sound like a broken record. Uh, go through DRC and then we would send it on, forward it on to PNZ for um, action. Uh, the infrastructure will be deemed accepted by the city with the approval of the final plat at PNZ. So that would be kind of the recording document that dedicates the right of ways, dedicates the easements, and the language on the final plat would say, we shall dedicate to, and the city is accepting it at that point. But we won't let it get to you unless we're ready for it to get to you. Uh, so this is kind of the vertical side of things, the site plan. Uh, so the site development plan, again, submitted. We're going to check it for completeness uh, in 24 hours. If you've uh, complied with our checklist, we'll move you forward. If not, we'll kick you back. Um, and then these site development plans are going to be administrative. Uh, the reason for that is, is there's no discretion. Either it's in the checklist and we require it or it's not, and you can't deny it for any other reason anyway. Uh, so it's simply a check the box exercise. Now, I will say with the blending uh, of our codes and kind of moving forward, this will be something that we'll, we'll use and we'll tweak and we'll be like, uh, we didn't think about that. And we'll bring those forward for uh, ordinance recommendations uh, to amend that ordinance. Uh, but this is one of the administrative actions. Uh, building permits. So you're at this point in the process, you've done everything from that first checklist and you're actually ready to go vertical. 
Um, your final plat's approved, uh, infrastructure's done, and your site plan's approved. So now you can go vertical. Um, this is a, um, and I'll, oh, I'll notice, um, I, I put a copy of the development manual on the dais. Um, we just wrapped that up today. Uh, I think Commissioner Cerno's hogging it down there. Uh, but all of this lives within that document. And the city manager um, and some of our other staff have, uh, well, our city manager has fundamentally changed the way this organization operates based around this. And this is the most important thing that we will do uh, because the legislator says it has to be. Um, so when they say you shall approve within 30 days, uh, it gets real serious real quick. And um, a lot of time and effort was put into this uh, to get it to where it is. And a lot of that effort's in that development manual. Um, that's one of the things on your um, agenda this evening. Uh, so within that, these, uh, we have the schedule of uniform submittal dates, again, once a month, uh, typically on a Monday unless we are closed, and then it'll be on a Tuesday. And then those days are kind of our double down days, and we'll actually do the completeness check and the 24-hour review um, all at the same time. Uh, so um, th those should be fun Tuesdays. Uh, this is a public improvement plan agreement. It's a draft. Um, it is in the development manual, so this would be the a document. Um, uh, prior to this, we haven't had a formal way to memorialize uh, who's taking care of the open space, who's maintaining a drainage easement on a subdivision, um, uh, what, uh, what parkland are you dedicating, what fees are you paying, uh, when are you paying those fees. So this document actually memorializes all that, and it will be approved and agreed upon prior to uh, the, or a notice to proceed to build a subdivision or anything that requires public infrastructure. Uh, this is the development manual. Uh, I hope you'll have a chance to look through it. I'm, uh, we will email this to you tonight, um, or we can have a hard copy available to you. Um, I apologize for getting it in, but again, this was um, six weeks notice with everything else we're doing. And so we've been um, working with our hair on fire trying to get us to this point, because uh, it's extremely important that, that we get this done before the 1st of September. Uh, so again, briefly, I'll go through the mid-level. Uh, this is just, again, that development uh, dictates your process. Uh, so this would be zoning. So our pre-development meeting is mandatory. Uh, so we require the application and an appointment and a sketch drawing uh, to, to come to that development meeting. And that includes kind of a, a sketch layout of your lots, your blocks, and your streets. Um, then we'd also kind of look at a conceptual drainage plan and then uh, land uses, fiscal sustainability, and we would give you feedback. So you would walk, a, walk away from that meeting uh, with written notes, um, how to proceed through our process, and then general ideas of, of your land plan. Um, then you would go through the zoning submittal once you'd have a, a pre-development meeting. Um, and it can be, uh, again, submitted through the schedule. Uh, we would review that for administrative compliance. Um, if, it com if it's complete, we kick it to the further process to come before you all. If incomplete, again, it's rejected, um, and they can try again next month. Uh, we will then conduct a public hearing, and then you all would wait, make a recommendation to City Council for approval or denial. And then, of course, City, city Council would uh, take action on the zoning request. Preliminary plat, uh, once again, a mandatory or uh, optional pre submittal meeting. Um, so come and meet with staff to discuss the process, design standards, and drainage requirements. Um, and then, uh, so this would be kind of for, for larger developments. Um, so that, that pre submittal meeting, rather, um, there's no charge for that whatsoever. That's a hey, come and talk to us, kick the tires, let us know your ideas. Uh, when you get serious about it, um, when you have to spend some money, is the required pre development meeting. Uh, so those are two different things. And at that point, it's when you have to do the sketch drawing, uh, the concept drainage plan, and again, discuss kind of the land uses and fiscal sustainability. Um, and then within five days of that meeting, we would then give you that roadmap uh, with the process, comments, and kind of what we talked about at that meeting. How often are the pre-development meetings? Uh, once, a once a week. That's supposed to be the same as it has been? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, we'll do DRC um, in the mornings and pre-apps in the evenings. Uh, so some people's lives are going to uh, go from a five-day work week to a three-and-a-half-day work week. Um, but again, it doesn't matter. The state says we have to, so we've adjusted accordingly and we'll staff accordingly. Uh, so again, the preliminary plat, this is step two, is a drainage plan. Uh, you would uh, get that from the stormwater drainage manual. Uh, it does require a geotechnical report. It has to be submitted and approved by the city engineer before going to the step three. Step three is that bird's eye view of the infrastructure. Um, again, that's reviewed by city engineer, public works department, parks, water, wastewater, fire electric, and then um, it shall be submitted and approved by the city engineer before moving on to steps four through six. So before you get your preliminary plat, again, you have to get a text dot permit, your lost ponds habitat permit, and any uh, uh, required temporary uh, construction easements. Uh, then once you've done steps four through six, you're ready for submittal. Uh, we do the completeness check, we review, we either kick it back or continue it. Um, and if it's complete, it goes on to PNZ for, for approval. So preliminary plats, you, you guys are the municipal authority that would approve that. Um, and then, uh, yes, again, it's 30 days. It's uh, 
um, an admin administrative function, but state law does give you all that authority. Uh, so final plat, um, again, you have to have an approved preliminary plat before you can get a final plat application. And um, all public infrastructure uh, must be built, and you have to have that letter, letter of concurrence by the city engineer. Um, so prior to this, in the middle of the final plat, you'll have to do your public improvement plan agreement at council. You'll have to have your public improvement plan plans reviewed and approved by the DRC and the city engineer. And once those things are taking place, again, then you can submit for the 30-day uh, final plat approval. Uh, so that will go through the completeness check, uh, either move forward or not, and then uh, the municipal authority uh, for that plat approval uh, would act on it within 30 days. So some final plats um, could be approved um, uh, administratively um, if they require like the public infrastructure and stuff to be dedicated that y'all would see them. Uh, so if it's not uh, public infrastructure, some final plats can be approved at staff level. Um, and then again, once, like I said, the, once the final plat's approved, and it includes public infrastructure, that's when it's deemed accepted. Uh, so the site plan process, uh, again, it must be zoned, it must be platted, um, it has to be all of those things before you can move forward. Um, and then um, only multifamily and commercial developments require a site development plan, so not single lot residential. Um, so again, the final plat submittal has to be done, has to be approved, um, uh, and then the technical details, it must meet city council approved standards, uh, and then we must take action within 30 days or it's deemed approved, um, and again, we have to give that a uh, written response. Uh, so, um, and, and again, uh, for, I think this is a, anyway, this is, the site development plan is an ad administrative function. Uh, so this, again, brings us to building permits. Once you're zoned, platted, constructed, then you can file for a building permit um, and, and be approved for vertical construction. Um, so this, this schedule, uh, we have to adopt these uniform submittal dates for site plans, plats, public improvement plans. Um, and the, uh, just so we have, like I was talking about, that internal capacity. Uh, we don't have the ability uh, to keep up with 90 different timelines on 90 separate 30-day submittal schedules and uh, provide any type of good customer service. So uh, these uniform uh, submittal dates are, are what we get. Um, and they must change to the PNZ Commission meetings and language in the ordinance to meet that schedule. Uh, so because we're doing this, um, is a reason for one of those agenda items. And I'll kind of show you how those correlate here in a second. Uh, again, the public improvement plan agreement. Um, it's the standardized agreement that covers the developer requirements um, and things to be accepted by the city, like assurance and in in infrastructure construction, impact fee payments, uh, certificate of insurance, and bonds. Uh, the development manual, again, it provides a nice, pretty uh, one-stop shop where somebody can come and find everything that you need to know from a raw piece of dirt to a certificate of occupancy. It's all in there. Uh, I anticipate that will be a, a living and breathing document, um, and we will need to come back and maybe amend that and tweak that at, at times um, as we kind of get uh, working with the new code adoption. Uh, but again, it, it's all our uh, submittal dates. It's uh, the links to the technical manuals, the development codes, uh, checklists, and things of that nature. Uh, so this is getting a little bit more in the weeds. Uh, the, I, I, I don't know that you care to hear, but we'll go through it. Uh, so again, this dictates uh, your process or development dictates your process type. Um, and this is kind of where I'll get to um, why we're doing what we're doing tonight. Uh, so the, the schedule of uniform submittal dates, uh, that would be action item 3E on your agenda. So that, that is what changes that you must approve the plans within 30 days or deemed to approve. Uh, it does talk about public improvement plans in there, which is more on the council side. Um, then it uh, establishes the zoning and plat schedules um, and that they are built uh, for PNZ action to occur within that, that 30 days. Uh, so when you submit something to the city, uh, we'll actually have it through our process within 23 to 24 days. Um, and that's just the way the work weeks are set up. Um, action item 3F on there um, is talking about the consistency um, of, your, of your language uh, for your meeting dates. Uh, so that's a reason for um, item 3F because we do have Thanksgiving. We do have Christmas. Um, we no longer have the ability to maybe we'll meet, maybe we don't. Uh, we have to have a meeting date, so we've, we've moved those up and, and planned accordingly. So that's the reason for 3F. Uh, 3K has to do with the development review manual. So again, there's a lot of things in Chapter 14 that you all have to make a recommendation as far as site development plans, um, what those look like, and that's all item 3K. Um, and then it, it does talk about those legislative mandates for 3167. Uh, handled as part of item 3K is the, um, uh, acknowledges that the development manual is dated August 27th, 2019 and is hereby adopted as reference. Uh, so again, that gives us the jurisdiction and the ability to enforce it. Um, item 3G talks about site plans. 
Um, so it, is, it establishes a review process that can meet the 30 days. It provides us a middle requirements. Um, it talks about um, changing from a site uh, plan to a site uh, detailed plan requirements. Um, and then it authorizes the director of planning development to administratively approve those. Uh, items 3J uh, removes the site plan as, as part of a plan development process. So right now in our code, we require a site plan for a plan development district application. We're removing that because that's a 30-day process and zonings are not. Uh, we're replacing it with a zoning concept uh, scheme, which is like a sketch drawing, uh, land uses, um, a conceptual drainage plan. So pretty much a concept plan. We're just calling it something different. Uh, and then it, uh, it also requires a site plan prior to construction, which our, all of our processes change, so we're just cleaning that up. And then item 3J, again, uh, talks about incorporating a pre-development meeting as a requirement for zoning um, and requiring the sketch drawing uh, with the definition like we talked about for those pre-development meetings. So with that, in a nutshell, that is items 3E through uh, 3K. Um, again, um, this was quite a process to get to where we are today, and um, a, a lot of work has gone into getting us to where we can be compliant with this. Um, the, the, the mandates of 3167, we do appreciate uh, your willingness to be flexible on y'all's meeting dates, uh, but uh, with that, I will open it up for any questions. In the interest of time, um, I have, uh, I, I would have hope we don't have many questions. I do have a question, but I'll wait. Go ahead. Well, I noticed that and I may be biased, but it's only a licensed engineer can develop site development plans, is that correct? For the site development plan, I think it, I thought most of the places it read, read licensed professional, like an architect. Or well, I know that on the cover of that, that it's passed around here, was not developed by an engineer, but by an architect. And I think there's a little bit of a disconnect, I know I'm saying something here. But I think one of the things we saw with the previous client is we're, what we're proposing with the build Bastrop better. I mean, the, it's just building Bastrop, it involves a level of, of understanding a variety of housing types. It's, it's my understanding that sometimes there's a disconnect between the, sometimes the engineering community who's solving a math problem and planning and architectural communities who are trying to do something that's a little bit more, for lack of better words, artistic. But in a way, that's kind of what we're asking everyone to do with the, with our new code is to marry those two those two things together. And I think by implementing this process, what's going to happen is if I were a developer, I'd go immediately to that list and I would eliminate, as the gentleman was here previously, it's going to cost him a lot of money. If all he has to hire is an engineer, that's what you're going to get. Specifically, um, which plans are you talking about? The site development plan, site development I'm just reading plans. here that it says sign and seal certification of licensed engineer who prepared the site development plan. Okay. I'd, I'd rather see professional. It would open up if I were an engineer. Some of them have to I'd be a licensed surveyor or, or other um, for a site development plan. Um, you know, I think an, a, a licensed professional could do that. Uh, to your point, you don't have to be an engineer. You could be an architect or other. Um, so I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Do you think, though, that, and this is just me asking the question, uh, in your experience, um, it takes a variety of people to kind of come together and produce the, what we're really looking for. And uh, I think that's, we've kind of raised the bar a little bit with our land development code. and. I, looking around a little bit of work experience I have, the best teams that are put together are a diverse group of professionals and they certainly can be led by an engineer or an architect or, or a planner, but it, it's, it's recognizing that this is a higher bar and that you're going to have to turn in a different product. And sometimes that initial sketch, you know, you're, you're looking for some really good ideas right off the bat or you're going to end up a year down the road realizing you know, we got to go back to square one and we're still not getting through things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tend to agree with you on that. Um, I think uh, um, a good mix of people uh, often in, 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 in my former experience, you get one of those plans and you have a landscape architect does a landscape plan. You have an engineer that does the utilities. You have a, uh, maybe a, a different design professional that does the actual land plan. Um, this. I don't have it in front of me. It could have been a uh, carryover uh, simply because site development plans in the past were heavily engineer 
it was drainage plans, uh, street design, and those things. Uh, so uh, I'm certainly open to that. Um, I think it's a great suggestion. I don't, if it says shall be an engineer, I don't. I think that's too strong, and I think any licensed professional could do could draft those plans or group team of. So that would be an amendment to the development plan. Yes, ma'am. I, I have that. So Not a licensed professional on the site development plan. Okay. So we would amend that when we get there, or make that recommendation. Yes, ma'am. When we get there. Okay. Okay, Pablo. Um, I have a couple of questions and maybe a statement. So what's the date, the actual date that they have to have the plan submission in by, did I see the 15th? No, it, 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 it's in the development manual. Um, so um, it, it's typically a Monday, um, but it'll be, um, gosh, I don't have it in front of me. I, but I, I don't mean to interrupt, but we have about 11 minutes to read through all these and approve or disapprove recommendations, so I'll just let everybody <laughs> yeah. know. Yeah, no problem. Um, it, uh, Commissioner Lee, it's, it's based on the submittal schedule. Um, I don't think it's the 15th. Um, without in front of me, I don't know the but there exact is, dates. like specific dates. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. It so is a calendar date through December of 2020. We already have those uh, laid out in that manual. So my question or, and concern, I guess, is, is it if if it's submitted on, let's say, the 6th, then PNZ would have to, um, it would have to be presented to PNZ within 30 days of the 6th, right? Yes. So then. This isn't an option. I mean, this no, is I'm state, you know, this is state law. What I'm asking is, so then the date would be set to give us enough time to have a meeting. One, yes, so that. The within that 30 day time frame, and then two, that means it would be crucial that we need to have a quorum every month. <laughs> yes, ma'am. To prevent. That is, uh, you hit the nail on the head. That is extremely important. Um, and that's why it's important to adopt these dates out um, as you get around the, the holidays of Christmas, November, uh, to have those dates scheduled so it can be on your calendar. Uh, so if these are approved at council tonight, uh, we will send out calendar invites from your next meeting through December 2020. Um, and then there's actually ordinance uh, language that says when we have to bring those calendar dates back uh, for the following year. Um, so there is no room for error. There's no informality. We say when you can turn it in. We tell you when we're going to review it. We're going to tell you when the legal notice goes out. We're going to tell you uh, when the anything that, that we can tell you is in that a uniform submittal schedule. And if for some reason we're not going to have a quorum, we know for a fact on this Thursday we're not going to have a quorum, would we then be looking at maybe scheduling? Uh, Everything will be approved the then. Okay. De facto by the no, state law, not, anything would be approved. The meeting, the, I would like not to try meetings, to... Our scheduled meetings would be within the 30 days if we don't have a yes. quorum. We could always call a special meeting you to could. meet that time frame. I'd hate to plan on doing that. I'd rather it's just but commit in the, in to In the years be I've been on PNG, I think we have not had a quorum twice. Yeah, it hasn't happened often. It's happened recently. Um, but without looking at that, I don't know what that does to the schedule. I don't know if we can accommodate a 15-day notification if needed. Uh, so it really depends on the application. So I can't stress uh, what you said is accurate beyond you know, or, you know, it just needs to happen uh, that y'all need to quorum because y'all are the authority on some things. And minus that, they're just going to be approved. And with that being said, are there any, is there any person that wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I will close the public hearing on item 3E and I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve as is. Motion to approve. Second. Motion uh, made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Unanimously approved. Open a public hearing on item 3F, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of ordinance 2019-32 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, amending chapter 14, zoning section 1, enacting provisions, adding section 6.2, annual adoption of schedule of uniform submittal dates for site plans, zoning changes and conditional use permits, CUP, Amending Chapter 10, Subdivisions, Article 10.03, Subdivision Section 1, General 
um, general adding section 1.1, annual adoption of schedule of uniform submittal dates for public improvement plans and adopting schedules of uniform submittal dates for 2019-2020 for site plans, plat, zoning change, CUP, and public improvement plans as shown as Exhibit A in order to comply with Texas Local Government Code Chapter 212, which requires plat, site plans, and public improvement plans to be reviewed within 30 days of submittal or deemed approved. Are there any questions? If none, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard? If not, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Motion to approve as is. Second. Mo moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Unanimously passed. Item 3G, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of ordinance number 2019-28 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, amending Chapter 14. Section 42, Site Development Plan Review and forward to the August 27, 2019 City Council meeting. Are there any questions from com the Commission? This, is there anyone? This is the agenda okay. item. You, oh, okay. I'm sorry? This yeah, is the agenda okay. item uh, that Commissioner Cerna had the comment to. So right. if you choose to, the motion should reflect that. Okay. Um, I will open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard? If none, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Motion to approve with Commissioner Cerna's um, recommendation. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 3H, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of ordinance number 2019-31 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, amending chapter 14, section 32-PD, plan development district and forward to the August 27, 2019 City Council meeting. This is public hearing, open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on the public hearing? Are there any questions from the, count, the commission members? If not, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Motion to approve this. Motion to approve. Second. Mo moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 3I. Public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of ordinance number 2019-37 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, amending chapter 14, section 33-CUPRCRC, conditional use permit, and forward to the August 27, 2019 City Council meeting. This is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing. Does anyone wish to be heard? Are there any questions from the commission? If not, I'll close the, the public hearing. Entertain a motion. Motion to approve as is. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 3J, public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of ordinance number 2019-33 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, amending chapter 14, section 10, changes and amendments to all zoning ordinances and districts and administrative procedures and forward to the August 27, 2019 City Council meeting. This is the public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard? Are there any commission? Any questions from the commission? If not, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Motion to approve as is. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 3K. Public hearing and consider action to recommend approval of ordinance number 2019-34 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, adopting a development manual dated August 27, 2019 in the compliance with Chapter 14 Zoning, Section I, enacting provision Section 6.1, Development Manual in Chapter 10, Subdivisions, Article 10.03, Subdivision Section 3, Purpose, Authority, and Jurisdiction, as shown as Exhibit A and forward to the August 27 City Council meeting. This is a public hearing. Does anyone wish to be heard? Does any commission member have a question? If not, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Motion to approve as is. Is there a second? Aye. Motion moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. So there. Uh, 3L, um, since we have five minutes, uh, I would recommend that we postpone this till our next so meeting. The slide's not showing up, but that was exactly what we would recommend. We do, do we need a motion yeah. for that? Um, you can. Is there a motion to postpone till the next meeting? Motion. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Updates. Um, we do not have any updates at this time for you. Okay. Individual request, item 4B. I have a question. Matt, just real quick, just to get on the record. My, you mentioned about the materials. Uh, we're not been able to control some of that. I, one of my issues with the passing of that bill is that the materials, we live in a fire area. We've had a fire. And are we in trying to dovetail our code uh, with fire prevention measures? and materials that would be better suited for that kind of environment? Uh, so we're not agended, um, but long story short, uh, the I codes, International Building Code, Residential Code, and Fire Code are now the bedrock of, of how we will develop. Uh, so if we're not controlling use, we care very much about that. Uh, just because we can't mandate materials doesn't mean that we cannot um, control fire and life safety. And if you want further discussion, we can always ask that Matt be put it, put it on the next sure. agenda. Is Thank that you. okay? Okay, Thank item you. five. Most to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.